Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back to Real Conversations, where it's an exciting time to have someone who needs no introduction, Mr. Peter Schiff, who's the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital and also the host of The Peter Schiff Show, a radio show that you should definitely listen to. So, Peter, thanks for uh, making the time. Thanks, Keith. We're kind of like neighbors, you know? We are, yeah. yeah. You're in Wilton, I'm in Westport. Yeah, you're in the high-end district. <laughs> the high-end district, for sure. Yeah. Now, uh, let's kind of just get right into it. U.S. GDP for the year, street too high or street too low on, on their estimates? I think it's way too high. You remember where they were on Q1, right? Back yeah. in the, the fourth quarter of 2013, everybody had three-plus you know, handles on their uh, first quarter GDP. And, you know, we haven't got the revisions yet. In fact, I think we might get a revision later Thursday. this week. Yeah. yeah, but they're going to revise it negative yeah. for Q1. So we're halfway to a recession. But everybody is saying, oh, don't worry. That was all the weather, you know. It was just too cold for people <laughs> to shop. That was what they're telling us. But, you know, it's interesting. All of the retailers that were reporting weak sales were the ones that catered to the middle class. It's interesting. All the stores that catered to the rich, like Tiffany, had blowout numbers. Mm -hmm. Or just look at the auto sector. You know, you had weak sales at GM and Chrysler and Ford, but Mercedes, BMW, Maserati, record sales. Mm -hmm. So why is it that the rich people can get to the Maserati dealerships and Tiffany's, but average guys can't make it to Walmart or Dick's Sporting Goods? <laughs> <laughs> you know? No, it's an interesting thing. I mean, and you've seen Dick's lately, uh, Staples uh, oh, yeah, reported I mean, the other. Yeah. These, these stocks are actually getting pancaked. And at the same time, you had this very interesting debate with Nura Rubini the other day where you were just getting to the kind of the wood of the point, and it's a point that we've been trying to make, which is as inflation accelerates, that pushes the middle of the country uh, into kind of a pinch from a consumer spending perspective. Well, and sure. You know, if you've got to spend more money on the necessities of life, the things you need to survive, if your grocery bills go up, your, your utility bill goes up, right, you have less money left over to go to Dick's Sporting Goods and buy, you know, another set of golf clubs. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a rising cost of living is pinching the consumer. Yet you got guys like Nero Rubini and a lot of mainstream economists saying the problem is we don't have enough inflation. Exactly. That the government has to make sure that the cost of living rises even faster than it is now. And somehow this is supposed to make us more prosperous. Now, how big of a problem is that, that Nero Rubini, who's supposed to be the risk manager or the negative guy, is actually representing that view? Well, he's, you know, you know, he's uh, Mr. Sunshine today. Right? He's, <laughs> he's, he really he's, is. He sees no problems. And right. yes, he'll talk about the various risks that, that might show up, but he assigns low probabilities. I mean, he thinks that everything is great, that uh, the markets are going to keep going up, that the, uh, the economy is going to keep improving, that the dollar is going to appreciate, that gold's going to go down. Of course, you know, Near the lows of the market, he wasn't nearly as optimistic. No, actually, he took, to be clear, just to timestamp him on this, he took this view in December of 2013 after it at all had happened. So he's kind of been landlocked in a position where gold's up year to date, the dollar's done nothing, and all the growth stocks have surprised to the downside as U.S. GDP and bond yields surprised to the downside. So he's actually in a really precarious position, and I wondered why you know, he was so agitated by you. Well, we got into... The interview that you're referring to was one that was on CNBC on Fast Money. And we did that interview uh, later in the afternoon where the two of us sh shared a panel. Mm -hmm. We were two of the four people on a panel at the Skybridge Alternative Asset Conference right. in, in Las Vegas. And we got into an argument on the panel uh, based on something that I said that Rubini uh, took exception to. And I mentioned that the obsession with central bankers, not only in the US, but in Europe and Japan, about inflation and that they're not being enough of it. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're telling us that the threat is that prices might f not rise fast you know, enough. The great threat of deflation. Yeah, the, or the, that. The depression, the deflation. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, but of course, when they're talking about deflation, they're <laughs> talking about consumer prices falling. Yeah. And I said that this idea that falling consumer prices is a threat to be feared is wrong, mm -hmm. that we should embrace falling prices, that this is the goal of the economy, to reduce prices. Mm -hmm. That's how living standards rise. I mean, if you're middle class or you're poor and you want to buy more stuff, the way to achieve that is to bring down prices. Mm -hmm. You know, automobiles, when they first were invented, were, you know, horseless carriages for the rich. The way Henry Ford brought the automobile to the masses 
was by reducing costs through the production line and the Model T. The first people that had television sets were the super rich. The reason we all have them is because they're less expensive. Same thing with cell phones. Mm -hmm. You know, Gordon Gecko had a cell phone in Wall Street. <laughs> Most people in the theater didn't yeah. have one. They were looking at this rich guy with a, a cell really, phone. A really big cell phone. Yeah. He had a really big cell phone. Now we all have cell phones. My 11-year-old yeah. has an iPhone. Why does he have an iPhone? Because the price went down. But he called like a lot of what, I mean, I, I can understand how somebody would just naturally argue with you. You like to argue with people yeah. too. But he doesn't, like, he just, he actually called the common sense nature of what you just said nonsense. Oh, exactly. I mean, and they have two arguments in favor of inflation. One of them is, well, we had falling prices during the Great Depression. And Japan had falling prices right. during its supposed lost decade. So they go right to the Great Depression, they go to Japan, and then they say those, actually he kept saying, those are the facts, those are the facts. Yes, it was and, like, and it was like a, a pull yeah. a doll string. But he assumes that just because we had falling consumer prices during the Depression, that they were the cause of right. the Depression. They weren't. I mean, if anything, you can say that the Depression helped to bring down prices, not just for consumer goods, but for stocks, for real estate and that those price declines were healthy and positive. You know, can you imagine how much worse the depression would have been if food prices had gone up instead of down? Mm -hmm. And all these people unemployed and they had to pay more to eat? And of course, what Rubini overlooks is all of the periods of history where we had declining prices and economic booms. Mm -hmm. Prices went down during the 1920s, too. I don't think you he know? wanted that interview to go on any longer, because yeah. what would happen is you'd start to talk about the 1980s you started to talk about the 1990s, under both Reagan and Clinton, you had sub-$20 oil in a high-demand environment. And what a, what a Keynesian economist, which uh, Rubini effectively is, he fundamentally believes that commodities go up in a, in a demand-driven environment. Well, when in so fact, there it, was a stronger dollar in that environment. Well, but if you, a real growing economy produces more goods, and the increased production, the increased supply keeps prices down, it's when you create inflation, when you print money, when you have a weak economy that isn't as productive, that's when you get rising prices. But the other ridiculous argument that Rubini and his ilk make is that if prices don't rise, nobody will shop. People won't spend <laughs> because we'll all sit back waiting for that price reduction. Oh, I'm not going to buy it today because I'm going to wait and I'll buy it cheaper, which I think is completely absurd. But he didn't look like he wanted anything to do with you on that point. He immediately well, went to the debt side yeah, on his because, answer. Well, because you can't defend it. That's what they argue. I asked Rubini uh, many times to give me the example of a product that he wanted or that he needed, but that he would refrain from buying because he thought if he thought if he waited a year he could save 1%. Yeah, this is, he's yeah. not the right guy to answer. I but mean, nobody. I might live in the high end of Westport, but this guy flies around <laughs> in helicopters. I mean, but at the end of the day, this is, this is actually an interesting dichotomy, though, because he would actually be considered relatively conservative amongst the Keynesian economists who run the country. Would you not agree with that? Well, I mean, I don't mainstream, but they accept this idea. But we know that it's falling prices that creates demand. If you can't afford to buy something, how are you going to buy it? The price needs to come down. Mm -hmm. If the price doesn't come down, you won't buy it. And people buy things when they want them, when they need them. Right? They'll try to get the best price they can at the time. And when they can but, afford them. Well, yeah, but if I, if I, look, if I, if I need something, if I need to buy a new car because my old car is breaking down and it's not you know, very reliable, and if there's a car that's you know, $30,000 that I want and I can afford it, but I think if I wait a year, I can get it for 29900 I mean, it's ridiculous that I'm going to wait. I'm just going to buy it right now. I mean, there's a time value. I mean, I, I mentioned to Rubini, I said, look, if what you were saying was true, nobody would have a cell phone. Everybody would be waiting for the cheaper phone mm -hmm. because they're always cheaper. But you don't wait. You buy it when you want it. In fact, I pointed out that a lot of Americans are so interested in having stuff today that they'll use a credit card to pay for it yeah. at 18% interest. You know, if what Rubini was saying was true, nobody would use credit cards. They would just save their money and then buy the products in the future at the lower price. Yeah, I mean, but this they is, don't. This stuff, like, look, my dad's a firefighter. He didn't, you know, thank God he doesn't have a PhD in econ. He and I will have the same discussion at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. You're having this discussion with people. You have this in the, in the political sphere. 
-hmm. It's a very basic point that you're making. So why wouldn't you just keep it this way instead That's of talking about inflation? They try to. They want to make you the hyperinflation guy. They want to make you the gold five thousand guy. Why don't you just kind of get it to where you have it right now mm -hmm. and nail it? Well, I do, and you know, and I ask these guys because when they say that, well, you know, if prices go down, that's bad. I'll say, well, is it bad if gas? Bad for prices? who? Why well, no? <laughs> I said, look, I'd ask, you know, individually, yeah. is it bad if gasoline prices come down? I mean, would that be bad? Yeah. Would it be bad if food prices came down? Would it be bad if uh, uh, healthcare costs came down? Right. Would it be bad if um, uh, um, if education, if college tuitions went down? Would that? You no. Know, so nobody can point to any price going down as being bad. But somehow, if all prices went down together, then somehow that's bad. How can that be bad? It's good. So in yeah. the, you know, now, like in the political side of things, which you haven't shied away from, you just ran most recently, uh, why isn't the inequality answer just that? Because you're basically saying that the top quintile or the top 10%, if you're being kind of this country, gets paid to own inflation. You and I can both buy oil. We can buy gold. We can buy real estate. We can buy anything that's inflating. But at the same time, you can't turn around and say that the 80% of people who have to eat those prices isn't our fault. Yeah, well, most people, the majority of people, are going to suffer a declining standard of living, a rising cost of living as a consequence, consequence of inflation. But there will be a number of people who will benefit, who will position their assets and liabilities in such a way that they benefit from inflation. Mm -hmm. And you know the key benefactor of inflation is the government itself. I mean, the government is the world's biggest debtor. Debtor, that's and why you have policy to inflate. Yeah, I mean, debtors have always been in favor of inflation. I mean, ever since they had paper money, debtors have wanted inflation because it allows them to repay their creditors in cheaper money. But the lenders want sound money. They want to be repaid in money that's at least as valuable yep. as the money they loaned out. So you always have this battle. But the government is the biggest debtor of us all. And the other thing is, politicians don't want to admit that they lied to us. They don't want to break a promise. They don't want to admit that they can't pay all these benefits. So what they want is inflation. Because inflation allows politicians to pretend to pay. Because they give you your money, it just doesn't buy you what they promised. And now they can blame the rising cost of living on speculators, on the weather, on greedy businessmen, on labor unions, whatever they want to do. But they never accept responsibility for themselves. And of course, they also use inflation to bail themselves out of stupid policies, like you know, the minimum wage law. You constantly have politicians raising the minimum wage, but then they need to create inflation to reduce the value of that wage so people don't lose their jobs. So the government pretends you're getting paid more, but you're not because now your cost of living goes up. I think anyone who's studied economics for real, anyone who's studied history, by the way, which is what you should study before you study economics to know who's lying in the economic domain, I think they get that. Why doesn't the media? Well, I mean, you know, you've got a bunch of liberals that <laughs> permeate the media. You know. No, but a liberal, let's define a liberal. I'm a liberal. You know? Well, I'm not talking about liberal in the sense of a classic liberal wanting limited government and, and, and freedom. Uh, people that believe in government. I mean, modern day liberals are socialists. You know, they, they, they believe That's a better that, word. I like yeah, that. Yeah. They believe that there's an inherent evil in capitalism or free enterprise and that there's an unfair outcome and that government needs to, uh, you know, make sure that the, the rich don't take advantage of everybody else and exploit everybody else. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's the way they think. So how come the socialist hasn't tied down all-time high in U.S. cost of living? Rent is at an all-time high. You've gone through a whole bunch of things that have education, obviously, at an all-time high. But the cost of living in this country is at an all-time high due to a policy to inflate by the Federal Reserve. How come the socialists don't get that? Well, I don't think they get it because they want the government to keep spending money. They don't realize that the source of that spending is inflation. The government has huge deficits, and the Fed monetizes them, so the Fed prints money. Uh, and so the only way for the liberals to support all these government spending programs would either be to support higher taxes on the middle class, which they don't want to do, so they have to support the deficits. They have to support the inflation. They, and they don't want to acknowledge that the reason we have this rising cost of living is because of all this government spending that is being financed okay, by the Fed. So I get that part. For them, it's a lot about how they get paid, too. But on the Republican side, I mean, quote unquote conservatives, I see a lot of them asking for more, more, more Fed policy, too. Well, because it makes their jobs a lot easier. It's like a get out of jail free card. They don't have to make the, 
the difficult political choices. I mean, most Republicans are in favor of big government too. Maybe yeah. they want big government in the Defense Department. And there are very few public Republicans, if any, that are gonna come out against Social Security, against Medicare. Uh, this stuff is very expensive. It has to be paid for. They don't wanna tell the voters that they have to pay for it in terms of higher income taxes. So they're, they all want the Fed to finance everything. And of course, nobody wants the short-term pain associated with the deflation of the asset bubbles, uh, the correction of all the malinvestments that have been built up over the years due to the monetary distortions introduced by the Fed. Everybody wants to keep the party going. So Everybody wants more exactly. alcohol. They want more, like this morning I kept saying, need more cowbell. I mean, we have to have, basically to perpetuate all bubbles all the time, and on any correction, we have to come up with the next idea to perpetuate a bubble that just blew up. So housing is a good, uh, good one uh, within the context of what you said. If you're getting squeezed and you're middle of America, median consumer income in this country is just inside of 50,000, you gotta spend 47, 48 just to stay alive. So you got no money left. So the government's trying to create an incentive for you to go buy a house that just went up 20% in price again. So you can't afford it. So housing's starting to slow again. So yeah, how well, do they reflate that puppy? Well, you know, the, the solution to housing affordability is lower housing prices. Yes. But the government is determined Bingo. not to let house prices come down. The government is trying to keep house prices inflated. <clears throat> so who is buying houses? Hedge funds, private equity funds, <laughs> home ownership in America is at a 19 year low. So what's a bigger yeah. lobby, the hedge fund or the institute? It's not just hedge funds, Blackstone's not a hedge fund, but I mean. The private you, equity. You know, the institutional lobby to keep the asset price high, the guy who owns the REITs, the guy who owns the actual, you know, 8,000 houses in a, in a district that he never thought that he'd be in. You know, what, who has that lobby to protect this all time yeah. high in, in home prices? Yeah, well there's a lot of people, the banks certainly, because the banks are holding the mortgages. It's and the they collateral. Need their collateral. Yeah. Uh, and, but, People who don't own homes right now, they don't benefit from high home prices. If you don't own a home and you want to buy one, the best thing is for the real estate to go down. But even if you already own real estate and you're underwater on your mortgage, an increase in the price doesn't help you because you're probably still underwater. <laughs> exactly. What you really want is the price to collapse so your bank has to give you a better mortgage where they tear it up, give you a lower you know, principal amount, and now you can really start to build equity again. All of this trying to prop up home prices is all for the benefit of the lenders, the banks, not the homeowners or the home exactly. buyers. They would be better served with lower prices. And as I said, meantime, you got home ownership rates at 19 year lows. You got most people now that used to own homes, they're now renting. And the problem is rents are going up along with everything else. They're not just going up. They're at, and I feel like I should say this every day when I write a note. Rents are at all time highs. 34% of the country rents and the percentage is increasing in terms of people that are forced to rent. So, and, and it's and the biggest <clears throat> nut of what they have to spend. And when the government though, you know, 40% of the CPI is rent, but it's not actual rents. It's, it's something called owner's equivalent rent, yeah. where they theoretically talk to people who own homes, who aren't renting homes, they're owning them. And they ask them, well, what do you think your house would rent for if it was for rent? Yeah. And they try to base it on those guesstimates. I mean, it, Why don't they just use actual rents? Because they don't want to, because then the CPI would be a much bigger number. It's absurd. I mean, they've changed the CPI calculation nine times since 1996, just so that there never is any reported inflation. But yeah, that is the goal. The goal of the constant rejiggering of the formula mm -hmm. is to get a lower number. Just look, look, they just recently changed the way they calculate GDP. Mm -hmm. They threw a bunch of things in there that weren't in there before. <laughs> Why? Because they want the number bigger. They want to pretend the economy is bigger than it actually is. So this is where you really get people going on these, you know, some of your YouTube videos are obviously epic. You've picked some great tranches where you've had, you, even Scarborough, you got him going on some of these things. Somebody's going to turn around and say, you know what, Peter, you just want precious metals to go up because you own a, bro <laughs> a broker-dealer. No, to be clear, you own a broker-dealer, precious, precious well, metals. Well, I own a broker-dealer, but I also own a precious metals company. I mean, right. I own a lot of that. You own I, both. I, yeah, and I also have a bank, and I have an asset management company. I have a number of companies. But I certainly will benefit from higher gold prices because it's going to be good for my gold business. More people are going to want to buy as the price is going up. And I own a lot of gold. I own a lot of gold stocks. So I will benefit from the increase, but nothing that I'm saying or doing is gonna cause the gold price to go up. Yeah, that's I mean, a great point. I'm not, I'm not that influential. In fact, if you actually look at what I'm advocating for, everything that I'm advocating for is bearish for gold. The things that I want the government to do, the things that I want You're the right. Federal Reserve to do, You're right. would be negative for yeah. my gold position. 
If the, if the Federal right. Reserve were to raise interest rates on 60 minutes, there's a super secret meeting, they have it 60 minutes on Sunday night instead of this Michael Lewis stuff, they're going to raise rates. Gold, oil, all these commodity prices would go down. Yeah, I mean, if the government acted responsibly, right, that would counter my investment mm -hmm. thesis. But I'm investing the way I'm investing because I'm sure the government is not going to be responsible. They're going to be reckless. They're going to keep on printing money uh, until we have a currency crisis. And so I'm prepared for what I think is going to happen. But despite that, I still advocate for what I, would, what I want to happen, what I think is good for the country. But what the government is going to do is not going to be good for the country, but it's going to be good for gold. And so I might as well help position my clients for what I think is going to happen, not what I hope will happen. Yeah, and what you end up getting is this almost polarizing compare and contrast between you, MSNBC, you, Joe Scarborough, you and this, you and that. But the reality is that this country really doesn't have a, a, a big representation, a big loud megaphone for the people anymore on, on cost of living, for example. Well, no, and, and even the people who are defending the bailouts, I mean, look at, you know, Timothy Geithner going on, you know, The Daily Show and trying to say we did it for the people. Geithner. We bailed, we, yeah, we bailed out Wall Street, right? We bailed out the bankers to help the average guy so he wouldn't lose his job. I mean, they're trying to wrap that as if, you know, it was all about protecting average people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. Average people would have been in better shape had we allowed uh, these big banks to fail. Had we re allowed a legitimate restructuring of the economy, uh, that would have served the average uh, worker, the average consumer, not what the government is doing. Now, a Geithner, though, like his, if you just like actually ask normal people, forget all these people that you know, get paid to stay on TV and get paid to stay in political office. I mean, he, for all intents and purposes, is a modern-day Wesley Mouch. I mean, this guy has spent no time other in his born life post-college, post-Dartmouth, doing anything other than be in the government. So here this guy is representing American values and saving everybody from themselves. Is that kind of what he's trying to say? Well, he's trying to get us to believe, and he's trying to validate these actions by telling the people that, well, Yes, we had to bail out these rich bankers, but it wasn't because we wanted to. You know, we wanted to save everybody else, and so we had no choice but to hold our nose and do this. They did have a choice, you know. And the bailouts weren't really necessarily for the bankers. I think it was for themselves. The politicians were trying to protect their own butts, mm -hmm. right? They, they didn't want everything collapsing around them. They were afraid that they wouldn't be reelected. Uh, if we really had to deal with the consequences of all these bad policies, which is what we need to do. Instead, they tried to reflate the bubbles. Uh, but when you do that, you simply postpone the inevitable. You yep. make the problems bigger, and so the inevitable pain associated with correcting the problems is worse. But the politicians don't care about worse problems in the future because that might not be their problem because they might not be in office in the future. Mm -hmm. All they care about is what can I do to get reelected? And we're not going to get reelected by asking voters to swallow some bitter tasting medicine, even though it's going to work. So we'll give them snake oil, pretend it will work, and get their vote. People will take snake oil. I, I listen to it all the time. Go for a walk in Westchester or somewhere in the tri states, a nice golf course where all, you know, well, all the people like me, I guess, hang out. And, and what they're going to tell you is that, oh, I own an MLP, it pays me this yield, forget about the accounting chicanery that's going on there, or oh, I own this or I own that. They don't actually have any accountability, the social accountability that we're going to ultimately have if you're right. <clears throat> because what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we need to have another collapse for this to be fixed. Well, the phony economy that we have now needs to collapse. Because if we want a real economy, we got to get rid of the phony one, right? If, if, <laughs> if, if, if we want to, you know, simply produce, put, yes. Right, no, but if we want to produce real wealth, yeah. if we want to build factories and produce products uh, that we can consume, and if we want to create good paying jobs that people can support a family on, we have to free up all the resources that the government is misdirecting to speculation, to Wall Street, to bloated. Uh, health care infrastructure, education, uh, all the things that the government is supporting, right, with money that the free market would have put someplace else where it's more badly needed. So we have to allow this restructuring. Look, look at all the retail space. Look at all the mall space we have, uh, you know, per capita. I mean, we've built too many malls. Do you think? Too many shopping centers <laughs> to fill up with imports. Yeah. You know, we need more factories, not more shopping centers. Well, it's centers. interesting, like, one of, one of these quotes that you had, and, and I, w I really... 
You know, my goal here was to get you to talk plainly uh, and, and civilly about these things so, you, so people could resonate with you intellectually as opposed to feeling some kind of, feeling something. That, you know. And one of the quotes that you had was that we need a plan that stimulates savings and production. Again, you're talking about productive production and savings, a base to build that production upon. Now, I think that that is so simple. If you just said that every day on your morning radio show, Instead of like, you know, <laughs> you know maybe, maybe it is good for us to go after Rubino, well, maybe talk, it's not. But if we yeah. stay with that, then we'll actually sound intellectual yeah. for once. Well, I always talk about savings. And, you know, my book, one of the books that I wrote to put all this in very simple terms was How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, which I recommend that people, you know, pick up and read because, it, you know, it, it's presented in a way that, you know, an elementary school kid can read it. Uh, and, you know, that was basically my target. I wanted to write an economics book so simple that a congressman can understand it. Mm -hmm. And so you think you Maxine know. Waters would get it? The, the, this is her only chance of getting it, <laughs> is this book. She's now the but, ranking advisor to, yeah. uh, to all this, isn't she? I don't know what, you know, but um, we don't want to follow any of her advice. But the premise of that book really is to, to show that the, the root cause of economic growth is underconsumption. Mm -hmm. That's what savings is. Savings is underconsumption. And everybody is trying to focus on consumers, consumer spending, as if that's what drives the economy. No, it's, it ben, it's ben Franklin frugality. It's saving a buck so that you can invest it and spend right. it. Right. It's the money that's saved that grows the economy, because that's the money that is used to create capital. Mm -hmm. And it's capital that leads to increased productivity of consumer goods mm -hmm. and, and higher living standards. You can't consume what hasn't been produced. No, I get it. I mean, you it's can't a produce without 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 saving. So I was on like on that point like I, I don't know why they asked me I guess they needed a Canadian who's didn't I'm not affiliated with any political party but you know on this bipartisan policy center debate on savings retirement and savings the crisis the pending crisis. I said, "Well, how do you even start if the risk-free rate of savings is zero? Yeah. How do you encourage somebody from an incentive perspective when the rate of return is zero?" So do yeah. we have to start by raising rates explicitly? They need to. The biggest problem in the U.S. economy is interest rates are too low. Interest rates need to be much higher. Now, I'm not saying that they're the not too low. They're zero. They're yeah. not even, they're nothing. Right. I There's mean, no incentive to save. But I don't want zero. the government to be setting interest rates. I just think the government should get out of the way and let the right. market determine the correct rate of interest. And I think that if the Federal Reserve was not influencing rates, that the market would choose a rate that is much higher. And in, in yeah. hindsight, that would actually explain something like gold, where you're, you're obviously you've been bullish on it from the from the lows to the highs, not uh, not on the correction, hmm. but you did, and you've said it in this in this in this talk. You said that what I am actually asking for is bad for gold. If rates were to rise, which they did last year, it was just a terrible year for gold. This is but I, no, but rates only. A, inched up on the long end. The Federal Reserve never let short-term rates rise above zero. No, exactly. Right, so what if they if, had moved rates up to 7 or 8%? Commodities, including yeah. gold, in that environment would get eviscerated. The, the point is that we don't have a catalyst to see rates go up. Well, the reason that they won't let rates go up is because they would bring about a financial crisis worse than 2008. So they need to keep interest rates at zero from their perspective because they want to postpone that, that day of reckoning. But when interest rates are zero, nobody is going to save especially when inflation is more than zero, because every dollar you save is going to be worth less when you go to spend it. So there is no reward to save. Normally, there is a reward. There is a good rate of interest. And of course, there's a lot of incentives now by the government to go out and borrow, because if you borrow money and pay it back, uh, you're a winner, because you're paying back less than you borrowed. So you have lots of borrowing, but not for productive purposes. Mm -hmm. People are borrowing to speculate. People are borrowing to consume. Uh, but we're not getting the type of borrowing that we need, which is the borrowing that's actually going to grow the economy because it's going to be money to finance capital investment. That is not what's going on. So we need higher interest rates to encourage all that, but that would prick all these bubbles and we would go through a huge a contraction, a contraction that we need to go through yeah. to cure these this problems, a, this but is the a, politicians don't want it. So your, your political cure for this, if you, were to, you know, if you were to become the president, you would, you would hire Paul Volcker and we would go through that 1981-82, get it in the soup, and then rebound from there. Well, it, you know, it, we're in much worse shape than we were in 1981-82, so we would you have think a worse? worse Of course. Really? We have a lot more debt, and the economy is a lot more screwed up. You know, back in 1981, <laughs> right, we still had a trade surplus. Yeah. We still had a current account surplus. 
we still had a lot of factories. We still had a lot of people employed in those factories. So, you know, that's changed. We have a much bigger government now. We have a much more vulnerable economy. We have much more debt. We're much more dependent on cheap money. Uh, and so the pain associated with fixing these problems is going to be a lot worse. So how would you do it? Because you well, can't that's people. We have to do it. You know, we have to dismantle a lot of the government. We have to get rid of a lot of agencies and departments. The government is going to have to break a lot of promises. Um, we're going to have to get rid of a lot of government workers. But if we get rid of a lot of rules and a lot of regulations and a lot of mandates that have stifled initiative and free enterprise and innovation, if the government can get out of the way, capitalism can you know, you know, achieve spectacular results. I mean, even though we are in this big hole that government has dug for us, we still have the ability to get out of it if the government will get out of the way. That's how dynamic the, the free enterprise system is. And do you see a political candidate or anyone within the next two to three years who has the ability to do this? Well, no, I could be hopeful about Rand Paul uh, because I know that Rand understands the problems. He understands uh, the market. Uh, the question is, will, as a president, assuming he could get elected, will he be able to carry this out? I mean, Reagan couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think Reagan understood the problems. Uh, Reagan was a free market guy, sound money guy, right? Um, but when he became president, he continued to grow government. Despite all of the rhetoric about shrinking government, it kept on expanding under Reagan. Um, you know, there's that old saying by Lord Acton, you know, power corrupts, right? And so you take these guys and you give them the power of the White House, and then what do they do with it? And a lot of times when people become president, they want to get reelected. And all of a sudden, they start thinking about what's going to help get them reelected, not what's good for the country. And even in their second term, they start thinking about, well, how do they help their vice president get elected? Or how do they <laughs> help their party? Or, uh, you know, so it's, you know, it, it, you don't know what's going to happen. But I do believe that Rand understands the, the issues, understands the problems, and knows what the solutions are, whether or not he would be able to implement those solutions as president, I hope we find out, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I certainly don't wake up hoping that there, it, it's some magic wand waved by a politician in any circumstances, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. I do think that there's going to be a moment in this country where either the electorate just decides by market force, and people are allowed to sell. They are allowed to call their broker. They are allowed to just say, look, I, I can't buy them up here at S&P 1900. Sorry, I'm out. And we're starting to see kind of that volume walk away from the stock market. So I wonder if it's going to be a passive collapse or if it's going to be an explicit political change. I don't know. We'll see. But the thing is, though, even if you believe the stock market is overvalued, if you sell and then hold dollars, you could be holding something that's even more overvalued than the <laughs> exactly. stock market. I mean, I think the biggest losses are going to be the people who have cash, the people yeah. who have bonds. I think they're going to lose more than the people who have stocks. Now, if the stocks that you have are these crazy social media stocks, well, you could still lose everything, right? Because there's so many stocks today uh, that have ridiculous uh, valuations assigned to them. And so, well, yes. you mean you wouldn't pay 20 times revenues for a company that doesn't make money? No. No? Um, so a lot You've of never rolled that way yeah, since And a lot of these social media companies <laughs> are going to go the way of the dot coms. Yeah, I agree. You know? Um, you know, this is a, you know, an echo bubble from the, you know, the 99.com bubble. You know, you have valuations just as absurd on companies that have just as much chance as, you know, Pets.com or Dr. Coop or any of these companies that, 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 that flamed out and went, and went to zero. But if you own real companies, right, real businesses, multinationals with lots of fixed assets, lots of resources, real revenues, yeah. real earnings, real dividends, I think you're in better shape owning those businesses than having a CD or a muni bond or, or a treasury. Mm -hmm. No, I, I appreciate that comment. I think most real people who run real businesses get that too. So uh, I would thank you for your candor. You know, this is one of the better discussions I've at least had an opportunity to have with you. So thanks for that. Oh, anytime. Yeah, sure. He's Peter Schiff. I'm Keith McCullough. If you have any questions for us, at Keith McCullough is my Twitter handle. And you can find Peter Schiff. I think he said, I think my Twitter handle is at Peter Schiff too. Thanks. <laughs>